The views and opinions expressed in this program are not necessarily those of Union Broadcasting, Inc., ESPN 1510, or its employees. The host is solely responsible for the on-air content. The following program is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. Investing in ETFs involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Any past performance figures discussed are not necessarily indicative of future results. Visit ETFstore.com for more information. Now it's time for the ETF Store Show. The investment pros at the ETF Store discuss everything you need to know about exchange-traded funds and the world of investing. Whether you're an investing expert or just starting out, Nate and Connor will help you get up to date on what's happening on Wall Street and show you how exchange-traded funds can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and allow you to take advantage of investment opportunities around the world. And now, the host of the ETF Store Show, Nate Geraci. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the ETF Store Show. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly in studio today. We're certainly glad that you decided to tune in. And Connor, boy, uh, it's nice to have you back in studio. It seems like about a month since you've been here. Well, I had some business work, business travel, Nate, last month that unfortunately kept me out of here for a couple of weeks. But Jason did a fantastic job in, in my place. And as usual, we had a very good lineup of guests, but it certainly... Good to be back in the saddle. Well, it is certainly good to have you back, and you'll be jumping right into the fire this morning. A lot for us to get to today. Last week, ETFs hit what I think is an extremely important milestone, and it was also reported that ETFs are set to, uh, set to hit another noteworthy milestone sometime in the next month or two. And while these two milestones maybe don't directly impact you as an investor, there are some trends here that I think are worth paying attention to, especially if you're someone not currently investing in ETFs. So we'll tell you what these two milestones are and why we think they matter. And then later, you know, we haven't had a whole lot to talk about in our weekly market update over the past several weeks. But this week, we have a lot to discuss. There's the GDP number, jobs, corporate earnings, the Fed meeting. So we're going to go through each of these and talk about the impact on stocks and bonds. And then for our ETF spotlight today, we're going to be joined by Bryce Doty, who manages the SIT Rising Rate ETF. This ETF seeks to profit from rising interest rates. It just launched back in February, and this is a somewhat more complex ETF. So we'll have Bryce explain this to us in layman's terms and tell us where it might fit into your investment portfolio. As always, if you have questions or comments, you can find us on Twitter, or you can email us at advice at etfstore.com. Now, we've talked on several occasions about how at some point, we believe the total dollars invested in ETFs are going to surpass the total dollars invested in mutual funds. Now, is that five years away, 10 years away, 15 years away? I think at this point, it's still too early to say. But just looking at the overall trends, we feel pretty confident in saying that we do think it will happen. It's really just a matter of when. And if you want some sort of indication of that, that we're not just pulling this prediction out of thin air, there are two milestones, one that ETFs hit recently and then another one that they're set to hit uh, that I think tell the story here. And first, on Friday, the Wall Street Journal reported that for the first time ever, individual investors placed more money into ETFs than mutual funds over a 12-month period. So through March, over the past year, individual investors put $267 billion into ETFs and $255 billion into long-term mutual funds. Connor, it's one thing for us to sit on this show and, and tout the potential benefits of ETFs over mutual funds and talk about ETF growth, but it's another to see investors voting with their own dollars, and that's what we're seeing here. That's exactly right, and and, and this is an extremely noteworthy um, piece of news that came out in this in this Wall Street Journal article last week, Nate. And here's why: I mean, when you when you're simply looking at the amount of assets in ETFs compared to mutual funds, there's still a large majority of dollars you know, still in mutual funds. But what matters about this new data is that we can now see a trend that more individual investors, again, for the first time ever, invested their dollars into ETFs and mutual funds. I mean, that is a huge inflection point, and we fully expect to see this trend to continue to accelerate going forward. And, you know, let me talk about the article for a second, because the Wall Street Journal article said one of the primary reasons for this trend is, is largely due to fewer advisors recommending mutual funds to their clients. And that's an important point, because it's confirmation of a trend that we've been discussing for years on this show. 
And that's that more and more advisors are leaving the commission-based, actively managed mutual fund model and are now working as fee-only advisors, fee-only fiduciaries for their clients. And by doing so, that eliminates the need for advisors to sell mutual funds with large upfront commissions in order to be paid. They can now offer, when you're a fee-only advisor, you can now offer your client you know, what you believe are the best investment options for their money. And what this data shows is that more and more advisors have determined that ETFs are the answer to that question of what is the best tool in my toolbox. Now, while I would, while I'll add that while more advisors are moving away from the commission-based model is, is certainly a huge factor in the rise of ETFs, Nate, it all comes back to the inherent benefits ETFs can have over mutual funds lower expenses, removal of active manager risk, more transparent and liquid, et cetera. Well, yeah, and we're going to talk more about those potential benefits uh, in just a moment. But I mentioned there's another milestone that ETFs are set to achieve, and this has to do with the mutual funds, uh, maybe more glitzy and glamorous cousin, the hedge fund. According to ETFGI, they're an ETF research firm, the total dollars invested in ETFs globally is set to surpass the total dollars invested in hedge funds and do so this quarter. Uh, Now, both ETFs and hedge funds are at just under $3 trillion. And, Connor, when you see trends like this, both the mutual fund milestone and and then this hedge fund milestone, you have to ask yourself why. Why are ETFs growing at a rate where they're now set to pass hedge funds altogether and and taking in more dollars in mutual funds over the past 12 months? And first and foremost... I think this is a reflection of how investors have changed their thinking when it comes to investing. Because when you think of active mutual funds and you think of hedge funds, you think of rock star managers. And especially with hedge funds, the glitz and the glamour and ideally the performance. But instead, what investors are finding are higher fees and really a lack of performance. And so now we have ETFs tracking down hedge funds. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of time before they track down mutual funds as well. Well, I, I like your description of hedge funds as the glitzy cousin of mutual funds because at the end of the day, that's that's really what they are. They're very similar, although they pretend that, that the hedge funds pretend that they're not. I mean, they're trying to sell you performance and star managers, like you just said, but with higher fees and more exclusivity as to who can invest in them. But at the end of the day, the results are, are shockingly similar to actively managed mutual funds, where these hedge funds struggle to produce performance due to their hurdle of extremely high fees. And while most of our listeners are likely not invested in hedge funds, it's still a significant data point. ETFs are very soon going to become the second most popular investment tool in the world. And we see this trend continuing, again, Nate, to your point, with mutual funds eventually being surpassed by ETF assets. You know, we don't know when, but it isn't a matter of if. It is a a matter of when and the timing. And, look, I mentioned this stat on the show a couple of months ago, but I do think it bears repeating with this discussion. In 2014, ETFs in the U.S. brought in over $241 billion in new assets, okay, that that shattered their previous annual record of $188 billion. Actively managed mutual funds for 2014, a completely different story. They lost almost $100 billion in assets. Think about that, $98.4 billion in outflows compared to ETFs bringing in almost a quarter of a trillion dollars in inflows. That is just a massive discrepancy in in performance in funds and in investors voting with their dollars. Yeah, again, the trends tell the story here. But, you know, going back to hedge funds, it's interesting because, remember, hedge funds have been around nearly 70 years. The first ETF in the U.S. didn't launch until 1993. So in less than 25 years, ETFs have caught the nearly 70-year-old hedge fund in terms of investor dollars. And according to ETFGI, if you look at the first quarter of this year, hedge funds took in a little over $18 billion globally, while ETFs took in nearly $100 billion globally. And, you know, add to that what we were talking about with ETFs taking in more individual uh, investor dollars than mutual funds over the past 12 months. And again, you can see what's happening here. The, The trend is accelerating And I think it's a huge positive for investors. Well, there's no doubt, Nate. And and you just mentioned that hedge funds are 70 years old. Well, mutual funds as we know them today 
go back to 1940. So, you know, essentially 75 years old. And the question I'm going to ask you as an investor is, you know, should we see improvements in the way we've invested over the past 70 years? I mean, think about everything else in our daily life and its evolution since 1940, from music to television to cars, you name it. I mean, the, the amount of innovation and improvement in the past seven decades has been, you know, literally unbelievable in certain circumstances. But almost nothing has changed with people with people and how they've managed their money until ETFs were launched in 1993. And I heard an interview on Bloomberg Radio last week with the CIO of a new ETF. It's an airline industry ETF called Jets, J-E-T-S, a great ticker. Launched last week. <laughs> but the guy, uh, the CIO said that ETFs were uberizing the mutual fund business. And I love the analogy. So like any good idea, I'm going to steal it. Um, but for our, for our listeners um, who maybe don't yet have them in their town, Uber is a technology-driven car service that has significantly improved customer service, lowered costs, and, and simplified the process of needing a taxi, of needing a car. Um, so just like Uber is turning an old, outdated, expensive industry on its head, his point was ETFs are doing the exact same to the investment world. So, you know, the bottom line is when new technologies are used to improve old ways of doing anything, but in, in this particular case, managing money and reducing costs and reducing expenses and in, improving transparency, you know, at the end of the day, investors win. Well, and that's what you need to take away from from all this data and these milestones, at the end of the day, this is a good thing for investors. You know, the Uber example, that's a that's a good example, certainly timely uh, with everything that they're doing. Another example that I think we've used on the show before uh, is iTunes or digital music. So ETFs are like iTunes. And, and quite frankly, mutual funds and hedge funds are kind of like the old uh, 8-track, uh, you know, from back in the 70s or the cassette tape or, mm -hmm. or the CD. But you, you're right because... Technology evolves, and even though ETFs are form, formed under the same investment laws as, as mutual funds, uh, there have been a lot of advances in terms of what they can do. And so with that, you mentioned investors win. And, and you know, Money Magazine, I saw they wrote a story last week on uh, ETFs passing hedge funds, and there were some excellent points in this article that I think fit exactly into what we're saying here. The article was titled, Humdrum ETFs are overtaking racy hedge funds. And let me read a quick blurb from the article. It was written by Ian Salisbury. He said, The surging popularity of low-cost investments such as ETFs will inevitably focus more attention on fees, putting pressure on active investment managers and even hedge funds themselves to slash prices. And in the end, that benefits everybody. And I thought that hit the nail on the head. And really, that's why stories like these are important to investors. And Connor, using your example on Uber, you know what that's done is, it's lowered prices for investors. Instead of paying, you know, eighty dollars for a taxi ride, maybe you pay forty. Same with the digital music. Uh, you can go onto iTunes and pick and choose what song you want for ninety nine cents a pop. That's what ETFs have done on the investment side. Yeah, you know, and it, it's the article is alluding to to pressure that's that's being put on these old industries. Um, investment management industries, and we're already seeing that. I mean, in hedge funds, and in, in particular actively managed mutual funds, um, you can see the outflow of funds and the, the damage that is costing these actively managed mutual fund old guard companies that haven't adapted yet, that haven't started offering their own line of ETFs. But you know, what's amazing is even with an ETF wrapper, you know, they can offer – hedge fund-like strategies or more complex management strategies that were traditionally the realm of active mutual funds, but obviously at a fraction of the cost. And, you know, Nate, when we're looking at the, to recap the the milestones we're, we're talking about this morning, you know, the first being, you know, ETFs about to overtake hedge funds in total assets worldwide, and then obviously ETFs taking in more individual investor dollars in the past 12 months than, than mutual funds. Look, if you're already using ETFs in your own portfolio, your advisor's already using ETFs to manage your money for you, then you should feel really good about that. You should feel confident that you've made the correct decision. But if you haven't started e using ETFs, yeah, I think this data are a very good kick in the pants 
to force you to take the time to dig into your situation and to determine why you aren't yet using them. And whether that's a conversation with your advisor, who continues to only recommend actively managed mutual funds, or doing the research yourself if you manage your own money, the continued growth of ETFs isn't slowing down. It, in fact, it's speeding up, and, and it's time, if you haven't done that deep dive yourself, that you need to do it. That's a great point. You know, sometimes I feel like we, we sit on the show and we're kind of kicking uh, mutual funds and hedge funds in the teeth, and that's really not the idea here. The idea here is really to explain the potential benefits of ETFs. And, you know, sometimes I, I use the uh, the iTunes example and the cassette tapes and, and CDs with, with mutual funds and hedge funds. Sometimes it might be fun to pop your cassette tape into the old Walkman and have a stroll down memory lane, but it's also good to check out the new technology and see what's out there. And, and certainly there's a learning curve and you have to become comfortable with it, but there are plenty of resources out there. Certainly we're a resource here at the ETF store. Uh, but but the idea is if you're not currently using ETFs in your portfolio, they certainly warrant a, a at least a look. They certainly do. And, and that's a great point, Nate. The resources out there, even if you don't if it's the first time you've ever heard of the of the moniker ETF, that's okay. I mean, there are very basic, you know, ETF 101 explanations out there on our website and on all the major ETF provider websites, you know, whether that's iShares, Vanguard, Spider, Schwab, you name it. Uh, ETF Database is, is a company we mentioned quite a bit, ETFDB.com. Um, you know, they're trying to kind of become the, the morning star, the independent third-party resource for everything ETFs and take a, a, an independent agnostic approach to all of that. Um, there are some outstanding resources out there that even the most novice investor will be able to understand and get their arms around what an ETF is and the difference between ETFs and mutual funds. Yeah, the key is when you see trends like this, you at least want to pay attention and, and do some deeper digging to see uh, you know why that trend's occurring. You know, one other quick note here before we go to break, when you do talk about these trends and the potential benefits of ETFs, we've talked about how many of the large established mutual fund companies are moving to ETFs. And I guess that also helps support our prediction that ETFs will ultimately surpass mutual funds. Well, about a week ago, USAA, this is the uh, large financial services company that primarily services military personnel and their families. Well, they filed for what's called exemptive relief to offer ETFs. This is really the first step in getting into the ETF business. But perhaps more noteworthy, it was reported that they might be seeking a structure similar to Vanguard, where their ETFs are effectively a share class of their mutual funds. Uh, USAA, they already offer a lineup of mutual funds, so they would use their actively managed mutual fund strategies but allow you to access them through an ETF. And mm -hmm. uh, Boy, that seems like a pretty clear way to start moving your mutual fund business <laughs> to ETFs. Look, mutual funds... They're companies, and they're run by that are run by smart people, and they are seeing the exact same numbers of asset flows that we're talking about today. You know, and and they, and they have if they have no if they haven't realized they need to get moving yet, they're they're falling behind. And this is USA is just another perfect example of an old guard, actively managed mutual fund company realizing they can't keep their head in the sand any longer and they are making the they're making the move to ETFs and and we've we've listed the companies you know that have done this uh, in the past and almost every traditional uh, mutual fund company that's been around this country for a long time you know maybe some have been dragged kicking and screaming and some have uh, been more uh, excited and willing to jump at the ETF space, but either way, they're all ending up in the same spot, and that's realizing they have to offer ETFs to stay relevant. All right, let's take a break, and when we come back, we have a lot to cover in our market update this morning, so we'll do that. And then later, we'll be joined by Bryce Doty, who will spotlight the SIT Rising Rate ETF. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. Want a more beautiful, livable home? Talk to Schlegel Design Remodel. No one offers more ways to add value to your home while saving you money. I'm Jake Schlegel. We have services for every need. 
like our popular one-week bath and express custom kitchen remodels, completed in a lot less time for a lot less money. We also offer professional handyman services for chores around your home. Whatever your needs, call Schlegel Design Remodel, 816-361-9669, or go to remodelagain.com today. Hi, this is David Van Oy of the Van Oy Group at Reese and Nichols Realtors. Thanks for listening to my friends at the ETF Store. When making decisions about buying or selling a home, you need first someone who is knowledgeable and someone you can trust. With nine years of experience and over $40 million in residential sales, I would love an opportunity to apply for that job. If you would like more information on a specific home or a property evaluation in Missouri, call 536-SOLD. In Kansas, call 259-HOME or go to our website, thevanoygroup.com. Love your job? We do at Accent. We're now hiring customer engagement specialists. Great team members, caring leaders, career advancement opportunities, helping our community. Those are just a few reasons why our employees love working at Accent and why you will too. We're seeking energetic, motivated individuals with a customer-focused attitude to answer inbound customer service calls. You'll receive paid training, good benefits, and a fun environment with room to grow. Apply at AccentOnline.com slash careers. There's a revolution occurring in the investment world. Exchange-traded funds, which have been called the next generation mutual funds, can help lower your investment costs, reduce your tax bill, and increase your investment options. This is Nate Geraci with the ETF Store, an investment advisor located right here in Kansas City. Call us toll-free at 877-365-3837 or visit us online at ETFstore.com. And don't forget to tune in to the ETF Store Show every Tuesday at 9 a.m. right here on ESPN 1510. Do you want more exposure locally and nationally for you or your company? Do you want to build your brand and reach more potential customers? Then you need j Media. j Media is a full-scale consulting firm that can help you with all your media relations, PR, and public affairs efforts. j Media can also help your business with any marketing, mobile app development, digital media, SEO, or content marketing needs. Grow your brand in an affordable way. Check out jgrowmedia.com today. Tired of running around town trying to find the best products for your business? Regal Distributing can help. With over 9,000 stock products in categories like food service packaging, professional facilities, office supplies, and sustainable janitorial solutions, you'll be sure to find what you need at Regal. Visit us on the web at getregal.com or call locally at 913-894-8787. And don't forget to check out Regal's state-of-the-art showroom and training center located off 435 and K10 Highway. Go with the local partner you can trust. Go with Regal, distributing service and solutions since 1955. Are life stresses beginning to take their toll? Take time to maintain your health by seeing one of our exceptional therapists at My Massage Bliss. At My Massage Bliss, we provide a level of service well above the industry standard by providing the best therapist, staff, and value for your time and money. Don't take our word for it. Our ratings and reviews speak for themselves. Come visit us in Overland Park on the corner of 143rd and Metcalf, online at mymassagebliss.net, or give us a call at 913-956-5100. We look forward to serving you. There's never a bad time to see your dentist. So if you haven't been for a while or if one of your teeth is actually starting to hurt, it's always easier to fix it before it gets worse. We aren't anti-dentides like the Seinfeld episode. So give Dr. Kevin or Matt Cummings a call at 816-246-1003 or check us out on our website, www.cummingsdentistry.com. Remember, floss the ones you want to keep and mention this ad and get a 10% discount on your first visit. Welcome back to the ETF Store Show. Nate and Connor live in studio this morning. Don't forget that each month on the show, we select one question sent in by a listener, and we answer it live on the air. We'll actually be doing this next week. And you can send us questions on anything investing or ETF related. Just go to ETFstore.com and click on the Ask the Host button, or you can send us questions through Twitter. If we select your question, not only will it be featured on the show, You'll also receive a $50 gift card to your choice of either Bella Napoli, the the wonderful Italian restaurant down in Brookside, or Starbucks. So be sure to send us in your questions. Now it's time for our weekly market update. And now it's time for this week's market update. Tune in every week as the ETF Store brings you the information you need to know on the financial markets. Interesting week last week, and certainly a lot of news to get to. 
The S&P 500 closed down nearly a half of a percent. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was down a third of a percent. And the NASDAQ was down about 1.3% for the week. You know, Connor, we really haven't had a whole lot to talk about in terms of market news or, or economic data points the last few weeks. But last week, there were several noteworthy items. And let's just go through each of these. First, on Wednesday morning, first quarter GDP was released. And it was a very underwhelming number. It showed the U.S. economy growing at a minuscule 0.2% annual rate in the first quarter. This was well below expectations. And a number of factors were attributed to this, including a stronger U.S. dollar, uh, which, of course, we've covered in great detail on this show, poor winter weather, especially in the Northeast, uh, and then the West Coast port strike, which, you know, this didn't maybe get quite as much attention, but this was a big deal. Mm -hmm. As major ports on the West Coast uh, were impacted by a, a union labor dispute. Now, this has since been settled But these ports handle about one-fourth of all U.S. international trade, and there was a significant slowdown uh, in exports. And then, of course, we also continue to have turmoil in the energy sector with the price of oil taking a beating. And I think all of these sort of conspire together to produce that poor first-quarter GDP print. Well, you know, when you when you think about what matters about the GDP number, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just simply our economic growth as a country. And positive economic growth is going to create jobs. So this is why, you know, the GDP number um, is so important as as our revisions to that GDP number in the coming months. But digging into the report, a few things stood out to me. The first was a 23% drop in, in CapEx or, or simply what businesses are spending, Business capital spending. expenditures, uh, which was a huge drop. Uh, exports fell 7%, and there's no doubt that the port strikes you mentioned were part of this. The, the West Coast ports are responsible for 12% of our entire nation's economic output. Think about that. That's a huge number. And those those strikes certainly weren't getting the press, you know, in the rest of the country that they were in California. Um, compounding that strike was also the stronger dollar, which, which, again, hurts exports because it makes our goods more expensive to consumers in other countries. The weather in New England. A lot of you get a lot of our listeners probably remember that Boston had you know some crazy amount of snow. I mean, over a hundred inches of snow. Uh, New England had a tough winter, and that is a very highly populated, densely populated part of this country, and that hurt output. And the energy sector, again, which you referenced, Nate, where we sit today, the this was a an interesting um, item I found. The total oil rig count in the U.S. is at its lowest number since 2010. Um, interestingly, having said all of that, some new in, uh, data came out this morning, which was the monthly import number and the import exports number. And the amount of imports in this country for last month and the fa- in the f- last couple of months was huge, a massive rise in imports. And the reality is that tepid 0.2% GDP number from the first quarter is likely going to drop negative because so much of, of what was consumed in this country was actually bought from outside uh, other other economies. So um, that is dragging on the markets uh, as we sit this morning. So, you know, to, to wrap all this up, the Fed, which we're going to get to in a second, is obviously watching this data very carefully and taking on a whole the news from the GDP report was certainly unsettling. Well, yeah, and let's talk about the Fed because they had their regularly scheduled meeting and they released their normal policy statement on Wednesday afternoon. And as it turns out, you know, they were actually rather dismissive of this first quarter GDP number. They said many of the factors resulting in the slower economic growth were transitory, that obviously things like winter weather and, and lower oil prices, these are temporary and not indicative of, of structural issues in the economy. And I think the best way to describe the Fed's statement overall was neutral. They really didn't offer much conviction on the economy one way or another. And, and I guess that makes sense because the Fed is kind of in no man's land right now where putting aside that first quarter GDP number, the economy has improved overall, but maybe not to a level where it's strong enough to make it a no-brainer for them to raise uh, interest rates. Boy, you got that right. And, and you know, for now, it, it certainly looks like a June hike is not likely, and, and a September hike is, is still on the table, but there's a very strong possibility 
we won't see a hike this year unless we see an, an improvement or an acceleration in, in the growth in our economy. And, and you know, again, Nate, the revision of this first quarter GDP number is probably going to go negative, which is going to put um, even more pressure on the Fed to, to stay uh, very lax and, and, and be accommodative in their interest rate policy. So, you know, a quick reminder to our listeners, the Fed has a dual mandate, two things that they try to accomplish, low unemployment and price stability, i.e. normal levels of inflation. And at this point, you can argue that one or both of these goals is not being achieved. Yeah, and, and certainly inflation is low, but it's actually not at a level that they want it. It's too they, low. They want, it's too low. You, you know, on the jobs front, we had some news there as well. On Thursday, jobless claims were released, and, and they fell to their lowest level since April of 2000. So the number of people filing for unemployment benefits was 262,000, lower than the 290,000. Also, wages rose 2.6% compared to the first quarter of last year. That's the fastest pace since 2008, and certainly another good sign. So I guess you can put uh, both of those in the positive column for the economy yes. and for a potential Fed rate hike. Uh, and then lastly here, we are in the midst of corporate earnings season, uh, and about 75% of the companies in the S&P 500 have reported earnings so far. Of those... 65% have beaten earnings estimates, but only 40% have beaten revenue estimates. And these numbers, especially on the revenue side, are not nearly as good as we've seen in, in some of the previous quarters. Well, Nate, I mean, in the last couple of quarters, companies have talked down guidance, and especially large company, large cap companies facing the headwinds of a strong dollar, making their exports more expensive. So... With muted expectations, you know, many companies have had positive reports um, on on the profit side, but um, you know, we're going, we're facing a pretty low hurdle that they have to get over. So it was certainly a net positive quarter for earnings, but we're eventually going to need to see real revenue growth going forward, not just continued profit margin growth to drive earnings. And that's what we're seeing in these reports. I mean, only forty percent of companies actually brought in more dollars, more gross revenue than they'd forecasted, and that's certainly a little bit disappointing. Well, let's pull this all together and talk about the impact on stocks and bonds, and this will actually help set us up nicely for our ETF spotlight with Bryce Doty on the rising rate ETF. Uh, for stocks right now, U.S. stocks are trading at elevated valuations. If you look at metrics like price-to-earnings ratios or, or Schiller's CAPE ratio, valuations are higher than average. Now, that doesn't mean stocks are going to go down, but at some point, in order to justify current stock prices, we are going to need to see continued improvement in the economy and continued revenue and continued earnings growth. And it's clear we don't quite have that yet. I think that likely explains why stocks are only up, you know, about 2% so far this year. And it's why there is some concern uh, looking out ahead. Yeah, look, and there's there's no doubt that you need to be cautious about investing purely based on valuations, Nate. And, 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 and the old adage, the market can stay irrational more than you can stay liquid, right? I mean, you always need to think um, about what you're trying to accomplish long term and, and not allow the noise and the short term, you know, media hype keep you off, get you off track. And um, as, as a related note, I, I saw a tweet last week that I want to mention because it perfectly captures the news media and how you have to simply tune out what doesn't matter. This is from Morgan Housel. He's a writer for uh, The Motley Fool, a very popular investment site newsletter. He'd, fa he'd found six articles over the past seven years with the exact same headline, quote, the easy money has already been made, end quote. And the point was, if you would have listened to that first article, which was way back in November 2009, and gotten out of U.S. equities, you would have missed another five plus years of the bull market. And you know, while again, while valuations matter, they are not helpful at all when determining if and when a bull market might end or, or even experience a hiccup. I mean, that those the tweet he'd reference had that article, that title listed essentially as an annual article written by different publications, but very well-known ones, very well-known publications that people are reading, just to show you the point that, you know, the media has to have headlines. They have to have something to talk about, and you need to have a plan. You need to stick to it and avoid the short-term noise that can knock you off course. Because for us, 
when we're when we're managing our investment strategies, they're all built on the foundation of diversification. And when you have that plan, when you have that diversification, the valuation, the short-term prospects of what's going to happen to a particular asset class isn't as important. And you have to be able to make sure you are doing what you need to to hit your goals over the midterm and long term and cut out whatever short-term hype and, and hysteria could would, which could knock you off course. Those are great points. And one last thing I would mention about valuations, it's not to say that they're meaningless. I think as you look at valuations uh, and where we currently stand, the likelihood of, of similar future returns is probably much lower Yeah, be, because absolutely. of where we're at. But but you're absolutely right. Trying to make short-term calls based on valuations is very difficult. We do need to head a break here in just a moment. But briefly on the bond side, uh, as we continue to talk about, investors are watching the Fed very closely. Rising interest rates uh, are a negative for bonds. So if the economy does continue to gain traction and even accelerates, we will see rising interest rates and bonds could go down. Uh, but again, that remains to be seen. Well, if and when interest rates start to go up, you will see your bonds and your bond ETFs decline in value, Nate. I mean, that's the inverse relationship between uh, interest rates and bond values. And while equity investors are are watching interest rate, bond investors are are really focused on interest rates and when they're going to rise. And look, the reality is we've been in a 30-plus year bond bull market because rates have essentially declined since peaking in the early 1980s. But those times are are very likely behind us. I mean, bond investing is difficult right now because you need the safety and income that bonds provide, but you are balancing those needs with the risk that you can lose capital when rates increase. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's in reality a bit of a catch-22 for bond investors, especially our more moderate and conservative clients that, that need the stability in bonds and need the income from bonds, but they also know that when rates rise, it, we're going to feel some short-term pain. Well, and the fact of the matter is, just given where interest rates are right now, there's not much further uh, to go down anyway. But, you know, for both stocks and bonds, investing is always challenging. But I would suggest these are some of the more challenging times we've seen. In general, I don't think investors feel real great about stocks, given where valuations are at, as we just talked about. They don't feel real good about bonds with potential interest rate increases on the horizon. Cash doesn't pay anything. It's very challenging, which, uh, you know, Connor, to your point, comes back to diversification. And then I would add having a plan. Well, look, it would be better radio if we sat here and told everybody how the market was going to continue to go up and everybody will be on easy street. But that's not the case. I mean, we're in extremely challenging times for both equity and bond investors, Nate, as you just mentioned. And, And you need to make sure as an investor that you are comfortable with and you understand the risks that you are taking with your portfolio or that your advisor is taking when managing your portfolio because you know whether you're in equities or bonds or cash you know we see some choppy waters eventually ahead for people in all of the above well let's take a break and when we come back when you talk about diversification in a portfolio one piece of that could be hedging a potential rise in interest rates and we're going to spotlight a new etf that allows you to do just that Bryce Doty, Senior Portfolio Manager at SIT Investment Associates, will be joining us right after the break to spotlight the SIT Rising Rate ETF. This is the ETF Store Show on ESPN 1510. Do you have any questions about your retirement strategy? Need help crafting a plan? Call an ETF Store Investment Advisor today at 877-365-ETFS. That's 877-365-3837. Or visit ETFstore.com. This segment is brought to you by the Bushnell Factory Outlets, offering big savings on a variety of brands such as Primos, Tasco, Hoppies, Bole, and more. Stop by either of our stores located in Lenexa, Kansas, and Lee Summit, Missouri, and let our expert sales associates help you with your purchases. The Bushnell Factory Outlet stores serve as your destination to purchase the most extensive assortment of Bushnell branded products anywhere in the United States. Typical estate planning is transactional, focused solely on money, offering cookie-cutter documents, resulting in plans that do not address what is truly important to you and your loved ones. Bridge Builder's unique planning process focuses on the three dimensions of family wealth. Financial, what you own. Human, who you are. And intellectual, what you know. Bridge Builder plans for life. Architects at protecting and perpetuating family wealth for generations. 
Please contact Bridge Builder for a free consultation at 913-956-3984. Will you profit from rising food prices? Bulk Food International. Do you want a tangible asset besides gold or silver? Bulk Food International. Would you like to own an investment that will be valuable 10, 20, 30 years from now? Bulk Food International. With Bulk Food International, you can own a variety of food products that will be viable and valuable for years to come. Bulk Food International will store your products for you or deliver to your location. Best of all, you can use your IRA or 401k funds to make your purchase. Bulk Food International, 816-888-8290. Investing in your future. Looking to ship freight but not sure how? Choose AOK Freight to be your single source for all your shipping needs and we'll take care of all the work for you. We offer the balance of budget friendly prices, seasoned account managers, and trusted trucking options with leading technology. With more than 20 years of experience in the freight shipping industry and having moved over $1 billion in freight, we know the importance of providing competitive rates and dependable services for truckload, LTL, and intermodal freight services for all industries. If you are a company looking to save on your shipping expense without giving up dependability let us be your personal shipping assistant call us now at 816-301-6226 or find us on the web at www.aokfreight.com for those of you who haven't heard the oldest building in kansas city has the newest rooftop deck kelly's westport inn's rooftop deck has a full service bar tvs bathrooms lots of fans and an awesome view of westport Kelly's has a weekday happy hour Monday through Friday from 3 to 7. They also have live music every Friday and Saturday night. Come enjoy tunes from bands like Lost Wax, Flanagan's Right Hook, and Michael Beer's Band. Every city has a place where the elite gather for witty conversation over trendy cocktails. In Kansas City, that place is definitely not Kelly's. For more information, go to kellyswestportin.com. Has it been a while since you or your financial advisor reviewed the investments in your portfolio? With today's ever-changing global economy, it's become more critical than ever to make sure your portfolio is on track. Whether you're managing your own investments or using an advisor, it never hurts to get a second opinion. At the ETF store, we provide free consultations on your portfolio. We'll highlight the strengths and weaknesses and tell you exactly what you're paying for your investments. This is absolutely free. There's no obligation. Just give us a call at 816-363-3837 or click on the free consultation button at ETFstore.com. Welcome back to the ETF Store show on ESPN 1510. Nate Geraci along with Connor Kelly in studio today. Let's go right to our ETF Spotlight. It's time for the ETF Spotlight where each week the ETF store highlights one exchange-traded fund. There are over 1,600 ETFs available to invest in. The ETF store sorts through them all so you don't have to. The ETF we're spotlighting this week is the SIT Rising Rate ETF. The ticker on that is RISE, a great ticker symbol, by the way. This ETF just launched back in February. And joining us via phone from Minneapolis to discuss this ETF is Bryce Doty, Senior Portfolio Manager at SIT Investment Associates. Bryce, welcome to the ETF Store Show. It's good to be here. Well, Bryce, first just tell us a little bit about your background and perhaps the background story on where the idea for this ETF came from. Sure. I've been at SIT Investment Associates managing bonds for 20 years, and uh, the firm as a whole manages $17 billion in stocks and bonds for institutional and retail investors. <clears throat> About three years ago, we started managing a rising interest rate strategy for investors that were looking for a cost-effective way to primarily hedge the interest rate risk in their portfolios. You know, as you mentioned earlier, some people are, are looking at using uh, uh, protection like this to even uh, uh, counteract some negative effects of maybe portions of their stock portfolio. Now, in February, we launched the same strategy in the form of an ETF to reach a, a broader group of investors. And we used $5 million of our own money to uh, help launch the fund, so, so you could say we uh, were eating our own cooking. Well, again, the name of the ETF is the SIT Rising Rate ETF, ticker RISC. And as you mentioned, the idea with this ETF is to allow investors uh, a way to profit from rising interest rates. Tell us how RISE accomplishes that. Right, we target uh, a negative 10-year duration by shorting futures and options in the two-year and five-year uh, futures contracts. We also have 
um, a smaller portion of the portfolio invested in put options on the 10-year futures contract. Now, when I say that the fund has created a negative 10-year duration, you know, what, what does that mean? What, it, what we're intending for the fund to do is to make money when rates rise, and a negative 10-year duration means if interest rates move a full 1% across all Treasury yields, we're looking for the fund to appreciate in price by nearly 10%. So the negative 10-year duration means that it's a 10 to 1 ratio of profit to rise in rates. Well, how does this compare to inverse treasury ETF, something like the ProShare short 7 to 10-year treasury ETF, ticker Mm -hmm. TBX? How would this compare? You know, they both make money when rates rise. Um, The expenses and the underlying cost of the, the futures that are used um, are a little bit cheaper in rise, and you get more price sensitivity. So the duration of rise, our fund, is negative 10. Um, the pro shares is only negative 8. Uh, so you get a little bit more bang for your buck. And lastly, uh, there's a very key difference, and that is our fund rebalances once a month. Um, most other funds are rebalancing daily. And in a choppy market where rates are, are bouncing up and down, which is, always seems to be the case, a daily rebalancing can sometimes cause a fund to underperform. So that's something to always, always be wary of. You mentioned costs, and we always like to consider the cost of an investment. Can you talk briefly about the costs associated with this ETF and, and maybe in a little more detail how those costs compare to some of the, uh, the other options out there for a strategy such as this? Sure. Most of these types of strategies have... Um, some uh, the base fee that is around one percent with an embedded cost of carry associated with shorting a futures contract. So the uh, the way it works is that if you short a treasury futures contract, the cost is the difference between the yield of the underlying bond and a short term rate such as LIBOR. For example, the two year treasury. Uh, the cost to short that is about a quarter percent. Uh, to short a five-year futures contract, it's about one and a quarter percent. But to to simplify things for investors, we've created a calculator on the on the website uh, at www.etfrisingrateetf.com. Uh, and here, it will take into account all of the fees and the embedded cost to simplify it for the investor. And it will show the net effect on a bond portfolio when you combine rise with an existing bond portfolio. And, and just looking at it and working with it, the, a rough rule of thumb that, that I found is that you can cut your interest rate risk in half for about a 1% reduction in your bond yield. Bryce, for our listeners who may not be familiar with futures contracts and, and shorting futures contracts, can you just briefly explain what it means to short positions on on futures and treasuries? Yeah, so uh, shorting is a phenomenon that uh, America came up with, and that is the ability to sell something you don't own. The hope is that you've sold it at one price, let's say 100, and um, you've borrowed that security from someone, and you have to return that security. So you hope that the price will move from 100 to, let's say, 95, and you can buy it back at 95 in order to return it to the, the original investor that you borrowed it from. And you keep $5 profit. So when rates move up, bond prices move down, and you're able to capture profit by shorting a futures contract in that situation. We're visiting with Bryce Doty, Senior Portfolio Manager at SIT Investment Associates. They manage the SIT Rising Rate ETF, ticker RISE. Bryce, let's talk about where this ETF might fit into an investor's portfolio. You've hit on this a little bit, but is this primarily a hedge to help protect an investor's bond portfolio? That's how it originated. You know, People use it defensively to protect their bond portfolio when interest rates rise. Uh, with its negative 10-year duration, just a small amount invested in a rise significantly reduces the portfolio's interest rate risk. You know, it's, it's for peace of mind so you can sleep well. It's, it's insurance. And, um, 
again, we've been managing this for three years, and rates haven't risen, but the value that our customers have had is that, you know, it's, it's like collision insurance. You want it in place before the accident occurs. Now, it's how it's been used more recently, it started to evolve a bit, and I, and I like that. Some people are just using it offensively. They're just making a, a bet that interest rates are going to rise. So they might add some to it right before an employment report, like this Friday is supposed to be a big employment report. Or they might add to it um, before the next Fed meeting. The next one isn't until June 16th. Uh, the, the last way that I've seen it used is is probably the most interesting. You had just mentioned how difficult it is to find investments right now that, that might not be uh, at risk for a rise in rates, that you know certain stocks might even be hurt if rates rise. And so some people will combine this with a, with a higher income-producing strategy. For example, uh, municipal bonds typically have a longer duration. And so investors have been wary of using them because they're afraid of how much uh, they'll get hurt when rates rise. Well, if you can bind a bond of muni portfolio with rise, all of a sudden here you can uh, uh, generate some tax-free income and still sleep at night. What's the downside uh, of this ETF for an investor? What happens if rates fall? Yeah, so if rates fall, this fund will lose money, and that's another reason that we've we've tried to structure around the two- and five-year treasuries primarily. So. The two-year treasury being at half a percent yield, you know, how far can it fall? So how far can you get hurt? So I like the the downside, uh, a relatively limited downside given to the unlimited upside potential if rates rise. The other the other reason that we've structured the fund around this two to five year part of the curve is because when people say they're worried about rates rising, what I think they really mean is like you know when the Fed is going to decide to raise short term rates. And when short-term rates go up, when the Fed finally makes that decision, the two- and five-year yields will really jump the most. And so this is structured to be right in the sweet spot for when that happens. Bryce, we have just about a minute left here, and I think just about every week in this ETF spotlight segment, it seems like we ultimately end up talking about the wonderful innovation in ETFs, and we talk about how ETFs have helped to bring institutional caliber investment strategies to all investors, and I think Rise would certainly seem to be a great example of this. How do you view ETFs, and how do you think they've benefited uh, end investors? Yeah, no doubt. I think it really does bring an institutional uh, effort and knowledge base and skill that is available to everyone. And this particular strategy, it's even a little bit better. You have more liquidity than our, than our existing institutional product because of the nature of ETFs. You know, it's so great you can get in and out of this throughout the day. Uh, it's, it's also a very inexpensive way to, to purchase this. You know, there's, the commissions are low. It's, it's just so much more flexible and, um, and very effective. We, we believe this is the most cost-effective protection that you can get right now, and it's available to everyone. Well, Bryce, with that, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Very interesting ETF. We certainly appreciate you joining us this morning. All right. Thank you very much. That was Bryce Doty, Senior Portfolio Manager at SIT Investment Associates. And if you would like to learn more about the SIT Rising Rate ETF, you can visit risingrateetf.com. And I should note that they have a, a wonderful tool on their website. I think Bryce mentioned this. It's called the Rise Calculator, and it allows you to calculate the impact of interest rate increases on your current bond portfolio and then how Rise could help hedge that. It's a really neat tool. I, I think certainly worth a look for anybody investing in bonds. Again, that's at risingrateetf.com. And, and kind of, we have just about a minute left here on the show. You know, it's funny because we do these spotlights every week. I, I just mentioned it uh, with Bryce. Here you have a, a rather sophisticated investment strategy that is now available to the masses. And you have to ask yourself, you know, when the Fed does ultimately raise interest rates, and they will, this could be a very interesting hedge in a portfolio. Well, first of all, when you're talking about shorting futures and, and getting that complex, Bryce did an outstanding job taking what is a very complex strategy and making it understandable. Um, but it, it just goes to the democratization of investing that ETFs have allowed any investor. You can have a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars in an E-Trade account, 
and buy something like this rising rate strategy where you can profit and hedge yourself, your other bond investments against rising interest rates. I mean, it's outstanding. Yeah, very, very interesting spotlight. Again, that ETF is the SIT Rising Rate ETF, ticker R-I-S-E. That's all the time we have for today's show. Podcasts of the ETF Store Show are available at ETFstore.com and also Apple iTunes. Check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. You can stay up to date on all the latest from both the ETF Store and the ETF Store Show. Thanks again for joining us this morning. And be sure to tune in next Tuesday at 9 a.m. as we'll be answering your questions on ETFs and investing, including answering our listener question of the month. Until then, have a great week, everyone.